out of uh, Indiana, and uh, he came down to help me sort of dig through the Milwaukee line of products and batteries, and um, uh, and then uh, what I figured we'd do is I'm going to get a little background from you, uh, kind of interview a bit, and then if you guys have any questions, if there's anybody that's uh, off at uh, 1:42 p.m. on a on a Thursday and is interested in some some information about charging, discharging types of batteries, stuff like that. Uh, Ben's a good resource to kind of help us think through that. But I uh, wanted to have him come down so he could ha- kind of help me think through all these different versions of batteries for you know for Milwaukee. And we talked about you know technology in general. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, cell phone batteries and laptop batteries. Talk a little bit about obviously power tool batteries. Uh, car batteries um, and sort of talk a little bit about you know some of the questions that I have but before we get into this I mean who who the heck are you and why do you why are you qualified to answer these questions so what I'm still unclear on is you're the CEO of the battery battery innovation center take me back let's go (laughs) back to like college and then let's bring us up to speed on how that comes about it's a public profit non-profit or whatever the heck you call it and so help me understand this help understand you uh, and then we'll start to dig into batteries well uh, yeah just for for backstory personally so um i'm actually an electrical engineer bachelor's uh, electrical engineering at purdue um frankly uh, what got me into electrical engineering uh, uh, for folks who knew me at the time uh, you know my my uh, girlfriend at the time and now wife would say um actually i was actually considering the military frankly uh, and or culinary school kind of weird from where i am today um but um as part of that um in high school i actually started working with an electrician and um it was just something i enjoyed it was it was great to get my hands dirty uh you know as somebody who has you know adhd uh and and hyperactivity and uh, and also ocd as well um at, you know i'm always my brain is always spinning so that that hands-on you know i did a lot of other you know be growing up in the you know, middle of, uh, you know, nowhere, Indiana, a uh, great little town called LaPel, which has gotten a lot bigger since I left. You know, it was a way for me to, again, get out and tinker and learn and just, um, you know, my mom always told me I like to go over to people's houses and take their sweepers and their couches apart. Uh, I was just, I was always intrigued by things. So um, got into, um, as an electrician, working with uh, a group there called Humphrey Electric, who's still been a longstanding friend uh, and a mentor. Uh, worked with him and uh, and actually found that I really had an affliction for the electrical side on how, you know, some of this unknown forces, what you could do with that. And then also um, how the things went together. So, you know, spent time, you know, wiring houses as a, uh, as a high school kid, you know, rode over on my dirt bike, uh, you know, during the week and on Saturdays to to work with Dave and his team, you know, wiring new homes and and redoing old homes and working on, uh, you know, uh, commercial Um, and got, that's kind of what turned me as I was thinking about college. I said, Hey, you know, um, this electrical and this this whole that, that's what I realized I had the engineering mind I guess and that frankly engineering gave me an out because um, frankly you know I found that if I didn't direct myself towards good things that my mind wants to wander to other things so it was my it's my path my you know to use your kind of mm-hmm. term it's my obsession if I'm obsessed with those that's good if not I'll have the wrong obsessions and so um, yeah I went through uh, Purdue and actually went uh, actually looked at Purdue and then I talked to uh, both the universities and I said, Hey, I want to do something that really applies my engineering. So, you know, I was very much a hands-on, but I said, I don't want to be a electrical engineering technician. I want the engineering. I want the what's behind it. Why does it work? The science, but I want, I want, I want to get my hands dirty too. And so they, you know, at Purdue, they, again, great university, but they said, uh, you know, we've got a, you know, we've got a great competition team here. It's the solar car. And I don't want to knock anybody that's listening in or, you know, is familiar with the solar car. And I said, well, that's cool, but how fast does it go? Because I've always been, uh, I grew up um, racing go-karts, racing dirt bikes, racing four-wheelers, you know, just just always after stuff. And they said, well, we've got the solar car. And I said, well, that sounds cool, but it goes like 38 or 40 mile an hour. And, uh, you know, I'm like, what else do we got? And they said, well, IUPY, which is Indiana University, Purdue University in Indianapolis, our extension is actually going to be doing, a, you know, is going to be opening a, a race team. I said, well, that sounds pretty cool. And so this is mid nineties, got a chance to go down or late nineties, got a chance to go down and look. And sure enough, um, they were working with Lola and players racing at the time uh, and Penske and some others, a bunch of universities starting uh, a racing series. And ironically, they were taking brand new Lola chassis but the teams, their job was to actually put electric drivetrains in it. And, you know, again, as a guy who's done internal combustion engines all my life, been kind of a gearhead, 
all my friends know me, you know, detailing cars and wrenching, you know, two wheels or four wheels. It was a way to kind of tie all that together. Um, but then this new area of like this battery. And in fact, um, it's what started me down the electronics, the engineering, the battery, just all culminating uh, as one working on the IUPUI, the electric Jaguar was the name, um, where we actually were given brand new EV1 drivetrains from General Motors at the time, who was just north of us uh, up in the Kokomo and actually Castleton, uh, you know, northeastern Indianapolis. They give us brand new EV1 drivetrains out of the just designed and just starting to release EV1. And we basically were converting those into this race car, this IndyCar chassis uh, as students. I mean, with no, it was our job to take this raw chassis and convert it into a high-speed electric race car and then go compete with uh, 27, 27, 28 other universities all around the country. Um, so got to know batteries, and that's actually where I met a lot of my early battery guys, and ironically, at the same time, also got into electronics uh, circuit boards. So I'm a circuit board battery and electrical engineer, and I'm also an electrician. So I've got this weird, it's all electrical, but it's kind of electrochemical and engineering mix. So started into that, met some some guys from um, GM uh, and Delphi. Folks probably familiar with those names today. Um, you know, Allison Transmissions, BAE, were working on hybrid and electric drivetrains then. Obviously, the EV1 was the most prominent. I uh, got to know the guys at Cobus's Battery, which was, so the, the very first batteries that we were working with were these long, ultra-high performance lead acid. Mm -hmm. So they were the AGM, the first of the, I mean, they're AGMs out there, but they were the first commercially produced advanced glass uh absorb glass matte batteries you know the performance these were performance lead acid significantly um you know performance they were you know a huge step up and then we start to get um we started testing some of the nickel metal hydrides which you know that tech is still around today but frankly it didn't have much of a long life um so started working on nickel metal hydrides fast track um i started working at a company called diversified systems doing electronics um and it in circuit boards designing circuit boards and testing circuit boards but it took me back, ironically, back to other things. Everything that had electronics in it, as we know today, everybody wants more and more stuff portable. And the way you do that, you gotta have batteries. You know, we're wireless, we're a wireless, you know, everything's, you know, now we got the IoT age, you know, the internet of things and connectivity. So circuit boards wound up leading me back into batteries, ironically, those years working there, doing advanced power controllers, digital controllers and all that, wound up back into these advanced medical devices, flexible wearables, cell phones, drones, laptops, portables, tools, and then electric cars again. So I wound up there moving on to uh, an, a lithium battery company in Indianapolis and uh, and worked with them on uh, help patients. Uh, pretty, pretty awesome opportunity. It was a spinoff of Delphi and a, another company called Inner One. I got in heavily into lithium batteries. This was really when lithium was really, really picking up from a global deployment and spent time working on cars, planes, trains, automobiles, grid storage. Uh, and that loops back to, um, so left there um, in actually late 14 on a mission for the Battery Innovation Center. So the, um, I was called in uh, by some friends that helped start that uh, work. So Indiana's always had a battery history. We've had what we call a battery bloodline. Uh, again, it, it, as I said, dated back to the EV1 and before and all kinds of other electric vehicles and electrification in Indiana. Um, this center was created by a lot of public and private, so uh, publicly with the state of Indiana, the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, along with Greene County, where we sit, um, went together with a bunch of private companies. So Cummins, Eli Lilly, Rolls-Royce, uh, Roche, um, Delphi, um, some other names, um, some academic Purdue and others that said, hey, we're doing a lot of battery tech and we've got a lot of portable products and we've got EVs and hybrids and we're advancing this lithium ion. We need a playground to work together um, and also allow where we can just kind of be um, be free, if you will, kind of um, unbounded to advance this technology. So how do we push it faster, um, you know, for our next, our, kind of our next generation? So Bic, that's that P3, which is a public-private partnership. The folks put in the idea, everybody kind of pitches in for the funds. The local county put up, uh, agreed to build the building, which was a, you know, we're a little over a 30, almost a 40,000 square foot building. You know, at the time, it was the first purpose built battery facility of our kind anywhere in the world. Since then, we've helped replicate others. But for building of battery tech, so this is the, you read about, you know, the game changing, revolutionary breakthrough battery technology. 
Um, we are the place that helps make that a reality. So there's academic labs and there's, you know, scientists and engineers and others in their individual companies coming up with that new droplet, that new electrode, that new electrolyte solid state, you know, is obviously, you know, a driving factor right now. But there's people advancing battery tech. Um, this gives them a place to really culminate it and scale it. So um, the state said, hey, we got battery bloodlines. We got a lot of people doing battery tech for all kinds of things in the state of Indiana, from medical to military to automotive to portable uh, to consumer. We need a place for everybody to work together. And so that's where we started in, in, in 14 um, with a heavy focus. We sit right outside of uh, Crane Naval Surface Warfare Center. It's just a little odd adage, but... Uh, Crane is the third largest naval base in the world. For anybody who knows anything about Indiana, you won't find an ocean. You know, here in Florida, we got some oceans around. Um, third largest naval base in the world, the only landlocked naval base in the world, ironically. But it is the center of excellence uh, for our warfighter or peacekeeper for battery tech. So we were put outside of what's called their Westgate and Westgate Technology Park to also help as we work with the, we'll say the consumer, you know, the industrial markets. Um, the military is also looking at how, you know, at the time was looking at how do they use some of that technology um, to help our warfighter and peacekeeper um, stay ahead. So that's where we started under the direction of Captain Chuck Lasota. Uh, unfortunately, not long after the building was opened, uh, we lost uh, Chuck to late stage pancreatic cancer, uh, a, a late diagnosis, uh, a fantastic start. Um, but uh, myself and a, a friend came in and that's that's kind of how it came about is uh, that's my first time ever working at a not-for-profit. Kind of unique to learn that realm. I've, I've done all kinds of small businesses, been involved. I'm still today involved in all kinds of crazy stuff with batteries and competition and racing and uh, detailing and cars and, and mechanicals. But that was my first foray into not-for-profit. So today we've kind of pivoted in that 2015. We pivoted away from having commercial work where we have a heavy help to the military to today entirely commercialized. So we work with 300 plus companies all over the world, names you know well, um, you know, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the Cummins, the the Rolls Royces, the, the General Motors, the BMWs, Mercedes, uh, to help them in revolutionizing their battery tech, testing and making their battery technology safe and their systems safe, and then actually training and outreach. So that's part of the reason for reaching out to you, Matt, is, you know, you mentioned during, you said, hey, I want to I want to get to know more about batteries. And we say, hey, when we hear people say that, we want to say, we want to help you understand batteries so they don't seem so uh, taboo or, uh, frankly, some people think they're unsafe nowadays. You know, you read about the, you know, the lithium fires and others and people get freaked out. Um, helping people understand that it's tremendous technology. It's got tremendous capa capability. It's emerging very, very fast. Um, and that there's, a, it's bringing great promise, you know, as you can see with the Milwaukee line, as a guy who is an electrician, every tool I had when I started in the nineties, we had a couple portable power tools. They were NICAD. They sucked. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were maybe good enough to drill some light holes, put in a few finish screws, but today the job site, I mean, Humphrey will tell you, I mean, they're fully converted over. In fact, they're, they love Milwaukee's, but, um, I helped them, you know, work with them on that, but they've nearly converted their you know, their job site over this many years later to, to all portable. So it's, that's kind of my, kind of my story of how I kind of got around to this whole thing. And on the side, I'm, I'm a crazy gearhead too. So I love cars, love anything that goes fast. If it's got batteries in it or hybrid, that's cool for me too. So, so did, did the innovation center, did this place come into existence in 2014 or was it already that it already exist it was um there were some talks through the 11 and 12 time frame it was uh was built and designed and collaborated on in 13 but we opened our doors in uh in 2014 so you're the you're the ceo did you come in as ceo or did you come in as an employee <laughs> actually so I, I came out of interdell as an executive of previous as we were a lithium battery company that still exists in indiana uh producing uh you know batteries for electric vehicles and grid uh, myself and actually one of the other executives, uh, David Roberts, um, actually came in together. So he came in as CEO. I came in as uh, C COO, C CTO. Um, not long, so we helped kind of re get the center going. So it, as I said, it kind of started up with a quasi military spin. We said, hey, um, with unfortunately with the loss of uh, Captain Losota, we said we think there's a great need as as commercial battery guys we said there's a there's a need for this uh commercially and we think there's more customers frankly it's sustainable versus 
I don't want to say not counting on the government, but counting on, you know, DOD contracts. We said, why not go commercial? And so Dave and I, um, you know, kicked that off with a tremendous team. We got at the BIC. I mean, frankly, the best battery experts that exist anywhere in the world. I'll put them up against anybody that's out there. Um, we, uh, we pivoted commercially, Dave and I, and uh, a little while into it, David actually transitioned. He's with the state now, so he's actually the chief innovation officer for the state of Indiana, for the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. So he's helping leading all new tech that gets developed in Indiana, attracting companies to Indiana, pushing tech, and then I took over uh, during his departure. Um, I took over as the, the CEO at BIC. So. so do you guys make anything? We do. Um, we just don't make our own stuff. So we're, we're um, you know, folks are probably familiar with the term contract manufacturer. Mm -hmm. uh, we contract manufacture uh, other people's stuff. So they usually bring us the, it's the old uh, Porky Pig skit, you know, the talent, the talent agent where the fox kept coming in telling him he's got this great talent. And then he finally says, fine, 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 buddy, show me your talent. And then he says, well, I, he says, that's the best. He blows himself up. He says, best talent I've ever seen. He goes, you're hired. And he's like, well, I can only do it once. And, and that's really where we come into play as the companies come into us. Mm -hmm. They've come up with something, but they've Frankly, they've only been able to do it once, and they're not sure how to replicate it. How do I make number two, number three, number 10 million? So our job is to help them scale that tech. So we will, under a statement of work, take what they've done or what they think they've done or what they can do, and we help them scale that and commercialize that. So how many, I mean, is it primarily staff with engineers? I mean, what, what is the, I mean, you got a 30, 40,000 square foot facility. I mean, how many people are there? Yeah, so we, um, we've, again, with some of that pivot, um, but we've kept the, the same staff. We're continuing to add uh, material science engineering. You know, the, the battery today is an electrochemical system, uh, and it interacts with electronics, especially on the lithium-ion side. Um, I will say, you know, from a battery, we're not just lithium-ion only. You know, with the 14 fundamental battery chemistry that exists today, everything from historical lead acid, NICAD, nickel metal hydride, alkaline, sodium, flow batteries, there's all kinds of different battery tech emerging in other industries we work with nearly all of those daily uh, and historically as well uh, so we've got material science uh, folks we've got chemistry of course because again you got the chemistry electrical engineers pretty heavy mechanical and then we've got folks that have done work around if you look at like uh, fuel cells and others the membrane structures and those inner layer structures the mixing and coating uh, almost like a bakery you know in baking a cake or baking cupcakes those processes are virtually the same thing in the battery world. We work, we work with chemistry, mechanicals, um, components of those substructures, of substructures in a, an electrochemistry environment. So how many people is that? Uh, yeah, so we've got, uh, what, 15 right now uh, of BIC and then um, with our team. And, and in fact, we're literally got some more folks coming online. Um, and then we actually incubate a, a bunch of companies. So um, a couple notables, uh, so Underwriters Laboratories, for anybody who's uh, listening in, uh, and probably about every object in this, you know, in your uh, in your studio here that's electronic is probably got a UL stamp on it for a safety and certification. Mm -hmm. So UL, that is their best, what's called the Battery Energy Storage Technology Test Center. So anything that has a battery in it uh, most likely is coming to BIC through UL to be tested. So we've got UL in-house as an incubator. And then we have a couple companies that their technology has We've helped them uh, move it along, and it's to a pre-commercialization scale, but they're not quite ready to go build their, you know, $100 million manufacturing site, but they're, you know, past the R&D scale. They're actually incubating there. So we've got, uh, I think, about 40-some people between uh, three different companies that are on site. So they have the ability to use our equipment, work with our staff where needed, uh, and or run freely as their own company, if that makes sense. Hmm. All right, so let's start with cars. Let's start with car <laughs> batteries, okay? Like the traditional car battery. Yeah, lead so, acid. Yeah. So what are the what are the types? Um, tip, um, kind of three. You've got the typical flooded. You know, that's generally in what's in most the vented flooded uh, batteries that are inside. You're going to see the caps on top. It's got liquid electrolyte inside. Uh, the next one is where you've got a sealed battery. So instead of open vents. It's now just simply closed off, so you've got a vented, or, or sorry, you got a sealed battery. So there's the basically the non-sealed, the sealed, and then the third um, third version you're going to see in a car is the AGM, which is the absorbed glass mat. So where the first two, the vented, uh, the vented and the sealed, 
would have free electrolyte inside there, so liquid electrolyte inside between the, the positive and negative electrode plates. In this case, the AGM, there's a mat, there's a material inside there that it's absorbed into. And so if you would take one of those batteries apart in standard state, it's all going to be soaked in. So there's no free electrolyte inside there. It's a, a kind of a plasma or a gel that's inside. So my M3 has a little tube. It's a vent, right? Because it has a. It's not. It's not an AGM battery. It's a. It's a regular. What, what is that battery? I'd have to look at it. I'm a probably bet in that car. They're probably not using a. Um, they may be using a sealed with a pressure vent from a safety perspective. Mm -hmm. It's. It's. It's most likely. I don't know if you looked on it and see if it's got like a removable row of caps or anything on it. So if it's not, so I'm, if I'm thinking uh, non-seal, I'm thinking like a green top interstate where you can pop it off and put some water in. Is that the idea? Yeah, that's that's your that's your um, that's your traditional flooded lead, lead acid. acid. Yours again, without looking at, it, I'm gonna guess that it it may still be a a flooded. Uh, and the way to tell is the flooded are ones that uh, if they're turned over, you're still gonna get free electrolyte pouring out those holes. The sealed one sometimes will have a vent, and it may have a little electrolyte come out, but it's typically minor. It's not very much. So we have those two types of lead acid. Then we have an AGM battery, which seem to be more expensive. Why Why do they cost more? So, Well, one, you got some additional structure in there. Um, the absorbed glass mat um, are actually stronger, so they're, um, that glass mat actually provides uh, some resilience. So the your sealed versus non-sealed, and I'll just – throw an excerpt there the 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 unsealed batteries are again the cheapest uh the plates are you know just setting in there they're generally held in you got free electrolyte or liquid in between them from a vibration standpoint and a you know a shock and vibe you also got to worry about drying out uh, is that you know mm -hmm. that's where you used to have to check your batteries you know the forklifts still have a lot of those day where you got to pop the caps yeah, add like electrolyte our, our, and water. Crown, our crown we've got to go fill it up with water right yeah, yeah. So you've got to you've got to constantly top off that electrolyte solution uh, and keep the uh, you know the pH proper to get your interaction. If it dries out, the battery goes bad. The sealed are are basically maintenance free. That's you know that's the term they use, but it's it's supposed to be maintenance free. They still can dry out, um, but they're a better battery. It was to avoid that that um, water work, if you will, um, mm -hmm. you know that you got to do. The AGM, the idea was to take that one more level. That's the most advanced. Again, you get into shock and vibration, high rel environments. Uh, you get into longer life uh, because it's much more controlled and tight, um, much more tolerance built. Uh, it's like the ultimate maintenance free. I mean, a, frankly, AGM from a lead acid perspective is the most robust lead acid you can get. And so then you have, you know, Braille and some of these other race type batteries. I just bought an anti-gravity lithium ion battery. Yep. What would be a, you know, one of the things I was concerned about is that I'm going to take the traditional lead acid battery that I have, likely sealed, uh, and out of my M3, for example, and I'm going to put this anti-gravity lithium ion, you know, wh what, what disadvantage do I have in doing that? Probably the biggest one is cost. I mean, obviously, uh, I'm sure it's when you look at 950 bucks <laughs> for the battery versus 200 bucks or 150 bucks. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, a cheap lead acid. You know, you get a hundred, and if you get a high end, you know, some of the best Optima that are made, maybe 200 yeah. bucks. Yeah, yep. Um, yeah, the, the biggest thing is going to be cost. Um, frankly, the other one is just um, you know kind of how you care for that battery. You know, if you short a lead acid out, um, there's obviously things that can happen. You know, they can boil over, they can overheat. You know, obviously. You know, a bigger lead acid battery can still pretty, put a pretty good arc out. You know, almost a, actually people who weld trail side, you know, with Jeeps using batteries, you know, lead acid connected together. There's a lot of current there. But the um, lithium ion has a ton more current. So how much current it can put out. Uh, number two is just heat. Um, is that lead acids uh, do deal with um, a, not cold. Frankly, they don't like cold. You know, that's where that cold cranking amps, all batteries don't like cold. Mm -hmm. Lithium ions are actually better than lead acids down that low. Okay. So that is one advantage. Um, but on the upper end, the the lead acids will usually tolerate tolerate heat a little more. Lithium ions, you got to 
you just got to be smarter about them. That's why, you know, they say don't expose them to fire and heat and, you know, excessive heat and under engine certain areas, you know, depending on if they're shielded, you got to, you got to pay a little more attention. So. so the battery being in the trunk of my BMW is not a bad thing for my, no. for my lithium, lithium ion battery that I bought. Yeah. And the other advantage is weight. So obviously there's a significant yeah. weight savings. It's, it's like, gigantic. it's like 40 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. And, and frankly, almost all the lithium ion batteries that you're seeing that go into a car so there's a lot of different lithium ion chemistries and you'll hear, you know, emerging ones, uh, I wouldn't say routinely, but they're coming out still, um, you know, solid state and others that are being listed. Um, but the ones that you're seeing in most of the car replacements, because they're such a huge improvement, but they still maintain a huge safety margin is they're using lithium iron phosphate, uh, which is known as LFP, Larry Frank Paul, lithium iron phosphate, uh, which ironically is one of the heaviest lithium ion chemistries. I mean, because it's the iron that's in there. It's it's one of the heaviest. It's one of the uh, least power dense. But from a comparison to lead acid, you know, you're talking three times, three to four times the density or more. You're talking, you know, 40, 50, 60 percent in some cases. You know, uh, you know, it's always at least a third the weight or or less. Um, you get a much more stringent uh, voltage curve. So when you, you know, you hit big discharges, you know, which is starter, you know, most of the time in a car, starter or sustain grinding or sustain starting, sorry, grinding, um, you know, sustain starting, or if you've got, you know, demands like boats or deep cycles where you're going to be, you know, doing car audio and others, um, uh, instead of using current, which is what a lead acid battery makes up with it, it lags when it gets hit with draw, you know, an amperage draw, instead of making it up with voltage and sustaining the voltage, it uses current where a, a lithium ion, you're going to maintain that higher voltage. So you, you get more performance, less heat uh, and a better overall life. Explain to me uh, traditional versus deep cycle. What's the difference briefly? Uh, yeah. So uh, deep cycle is just intended. Uh, a traditional lead acid battery likes to operate at like the 80 to 80 to hundred percent. It wants to stay pretty much top of charge. The more you, and, and frankly, the more, and some of them won't even survive a 50% discharge. Mm -hmm. So that means if I take it down to 50% level, some of them won't recover or they have irrecoverable damage to the battery. A deep cycle is made to actually, it, it's made to routinely cycle under 50%. So you do give up some high end performance, but you get the ability to deep cycle it routinely without killing off the battery life. And what is the makeup difference w w internally? What's different about it? Uh, typically, uh, thicker plates, thicker coating, um, again, more robust structure. So the electrode structures inside are thicker. The coatings inside are thicker uh, because, I, I again, I got to hold up and not break down when I get down to that low uh, discharge. Got it. So let's transition to talk a little bit about, you know, the batteries we've been working on, which are, you know, power tool batteries uh, and what, what, what they're made up of. Also, I guess we talked about this in some of our videos, they would also be involve batteries used in cars like Tesla and you know the Taycan and some of the other you know the other electrical vehicles so what is that and, and another you know guy had a question here asking about you know what do you what do you think what do you think the difference in performance between an 18650 and a 21700 cell battery is so first explain to me an 18650 explain to me what's in like a Milwaukee or DeWalt or Makita battery uh, and then tell me a little bit about the newer you know 21700s and the performance difference sure so the um you know the 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 most common lithium ion battery that everybody's still going to run into, but it's quickly being replaced. Uh, kind of the standard that's known is a, it's a cylindrical format and that cylindrical format is called an 18650. Some have shortened it and called 1865, but um, it's an 18650, which is 18 millimeters in diameter by 65 millimeters in length. Uh, for folks who haven't seen them, it looks like a it looks like a pregnant alkaline, you know, double A battery. It's or, like a Duracell, but a little fatter. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, so that is the gold, you know, kind of the known standard and has been around uh, for forever. It's the only standard format at its time that you could go mass, you could mass buy. So, you know, there's a lot of other lithium ion formats, but it's the only one that everybody has kind of surrounded. You see it in e-cigarettes. It's used in power tools. It was used in laptops for a while until they've gotten, you know, ultra thin. Uh, you know, Tesla used it, um, you know, you know, Elon uh, got to give him credit for being brilliant instead of trying to do like other electric car companies and also design and engineer his own custom cell. He said, you know what, I'm just going to buy something and get off the shelf and let me focus on the car and integrating versus taking on, frankly, an even bigger engineering challenge than building 
a new car company. So, you know, kind of a brilliant decision there. So the 18650 has been the gold standard and it is in, you know, even in the Milwaukee line, it's still what makes up majority of their tools. Um, fast forward, uh, you know, Tesla and Panasonic along with, uh, you know, they're the most prominent, but there are uh, several companies that were already saying, hey, the 18650, that cylinder format, the biggest issue with that is um, as you get into high power drain, even though we've evolved the, the chemistry that's inside of it and the makeup as best as possible, there were some key limitations with thermal. So the inside of that cell, if you look at it, um, I should have brought one in here, but the jelly roll, and you can check out some of the other videos we've done. We mm. show that jelly roll. It looks like a hostess ho-ho roll. And look inside the cake and the icing that's all wound up. The center of that thing is the hottest. Uh, and so it, it once that gets hot, getting that out of there, you know, it, it's almost impossible. There's no surface area around it. It has to radiate out. And so they recognize that in higher power needs, higher drain, higher performance, you know, um, that we're running into heat problems. And so they went back to the drawing board to say, we still want a cylinder and we still want as closely compatible with our designs. They said, we don't want to throw the whole cylindrical cell out and start all over with some new format. How do we grow it just enough to optimize it to maximize our capability without getting too big. And, and frankly, they wanted it just like you see on the Milwaukee tool. You can notice when they're side by side, they've grown a little bit, but the new battery is not twice in size. It's, it's, you know, maybe 20% larger, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. Um, so the 21700, which is now 21 millimeters. So I grew from 18 to 21 and instead of 65, I'm now 70 millimeters in length. Um, I increased that slice marginally but we increase the overall capability of that cell the very first ones coming out were about a 30 percent increase in overall uh, uh power output so my ability to do work both density and so the voltage stayed the same but as far as density to be able to do work and how much work i can do there as well so power and energy so by making those tweaks and also they had huge thermal changes so the cell again the cylinder still has still deals with that i got to get the heat out of the center but because of the way they've done it, they've allowed themselves some more uh, ability, more surface area to get that out. So that cell across the board, poor form, significantly better. It was the the next best thing, if you will. Okay. And so then, um, you know, you picture a, a fatter Dura cell, right? The, but but it's not, there's no, um, there's liquid in there, but it's like a little. Like, it's absorbed, little, yeah. It's, it's like a ho-ho, like it's a, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a spiral, if you will. Uh, with gel inside of there, like an electrolyte gel yep. of some sort. Um, then they take these things and they you they either wire them in series or parallel, right? Correct. Yep. In order to accomplish the voltage target and the capacity, yeah, the energy density that you need to do work, yeah. And so uh, Tesla Model S has a zillion of them. Yeah, it, uh, depending on you know uh, which series, and obviously the older cars, you know, as they've worked up and had now the the one hundred. But, you know, you had the 60 and the, what, 70 and 80 and 90. You know, they had different variants of battery. Mm -hmm. There was basically thousands to more thousands. So I believe the anywhere 6,700. I should know this exactly, but I can't memorize all the cars now, it seems. About six to almost 9,000 of the 18650s. Uh, and they still produce with the 18650 today. But the new model cars, so the um, uh, the model uh, the model 3, was one of the first to start coming out with the 21700. So they have high quantity of those cells, but they're able to have a little less now because of the better capability of that 21700. And they're new, the Model Y is all built on the now evolving 21700 platform. So I don't think you'll see 18650s go away because they're in so many historical products. Mm -hmm. um, they're kind of the double A, but now it's kind of like the Alkaline. Now you had double A and now at double a back in the day wasn't enough and so they created you know the c cell and then they went to d cell so very similar thing as you're seeing that, that same evolution from a, a lithium perspective on the cylindricals so what is the difference between a you know a lithium ion at 18650 and a traditional double a battery what what's the chemistry difference how what's inside of them that if i were to cut it in half what does it look like the, the basic makeup is there. I mean, they've all got, uh, you know, a positive and negative electrode. They've got a separator, the material that's inside of them. Um, but it's uh, it's what the anodes and cathodes are made of, which are, you know, a mix, a mix of different types of metals. And then you have some other organic and inorganic uh, electrochemistries inside of there. So, um, you know, the tradition, uh, you know, alkaline batteries, you know, were made with, you know, you got uh, you got aluminums in there. Uh, you've got um, 
you know, different mix of acids. Uh, and again, some other different, uh, they had zinc air and some others that are in there. Uh, the new lithium ion, again, there's, you say lithium ion, but that's kind of the general term. Lithium ion or lithium polymer, I always hate when people try to say, well, lithium polymers are different. No, it's that, it, that means it's a rechargeable lithium ion, lithium polymer, are the same thing. And then you have lithium metal batteries. So if you look the newest energizers, if, uh, you know, if you've got any products where you use alkaline and now folks say, Hey, you should use the lithium variant. Um, you know, Energizer, for example, has got the, their lithium. That is a lithium metal cell. It's a primary, what we call primary. It's non-rechargeable. So it's put in, it actually has lithium metal inside of it, mm -hmm. uh, a significant quantity. Well, I say significant. It's much larger quantity than the polymer that's in the rechargeables. Um, that lithium metal gives me a one-time use, um, you know, ultra high power, ultra high energy density, but it's non-recoverable. So once, uh, once it is used up, it's done. So, w from a lay person, is it safe to say that a uh, you know a lithium ion type battery is acid free? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I guess in a traditional sense, yeah. I mean, you know, with the breakdown of structures, it can release you know HF and others. If you have fires and you know other things that can happen with lithium, you can you know cause uh, reactions that will bring you know other materials about. But um, yeah, it is it is quote unquote acid free. So since we're talking about this, um, tell me a little bit about, you know, this is the huge buzzword in detailing and four people have asked this already. Uh, what have you seen with graphene and, <laughs> and batteries? You know, it, it's funny. Um, I, I, so as a, again, as a battery guy and then also being a detail guy, owning a, you know, a detail company on the side for the longest time, um, it's funny for me to watch how like industries wind up going into other industries. So graphene uh and the uh nanocarbon gra um 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 uh, sorry um graphite nanotubes uh carbon nanotubes uh heat graph uh graphite helix structures are have already actually evolved lead acid batteries today in fact they're taking current lead acid batteries and they're getting significant life improvement you know the you know everybody says well lead acids haven't evolved well frankly the lead acid guys have said hey you know um Lithium ion isn't the solution to everything. And frankly, low cost lead acid, if there's ways to refine, you know, you know, the ICE guys, you know, internal in combustion engine guys have, didn't give up because diesel came about or, you know, the, uh, they didn't give up because hybrids and electric came about because they know there's still some refinement there. The lead acid guys started using carbon nanotube structures to make the lead acids last longer that they replaced some of the coatings or they basically dosed, you know, they sprinkled some of that in there, if you will, a little more scientific than that, but to make those batteries last longer, to be more robust, uh, to be more electrically conductive, uh, and to be, you know, safer overall. Um, we had been doing that for quite some years on batteries and then it fell into lithium ion. The, um, most of the batteries today use some sort of a, you know, a graphite electro electrode. So, you know, I say pencil, you know, think of the old lead pencil, not quite, it's much more um, robust material than that, but they use, you know, a soft graphite or a soft carbon or a hard carbon and all kinds of new variants of that. Um, so that carbon structure in order to create bonding and create electrical characteristics, uh, so kind of primer characteristics, if you will, is exactly why you started to see it being used in paint and coatings and now going into ceramic coatings. It actually has some significant characteristics that are it's being refined. In fact, um, uh, my internal, a couple of my, uh, my one material scientist, Dr. Fleetwood, him and I have been discussing, frankly, some of the discoveries we've done on the battery side. We said these would be directly relevant uh, to the ceramic coatings. We're actually, we've been kind of talking on the side about, can we take some of the tech we've been working on for others and maybe help them uh, make an introduction to, you know, the, the G techniques and others of the world to say, hey, we might actually have some some nanostructures that will be drop in for what you're doing on the coating side. That primer, the ability to create a better coating that you know the um, you know the traditional um, silicon can't do. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, cell phone and and uh, laptop batteries. How are those different? Obviously, my MacBook Pro doesn't have an 18, 18650 in it or a 21700. Not anymore, yeah. But is it the same? You showed me a couple of examples, and it looks like they take the same um, or something similar. They take the same jelly roll-looking thing, this wafer, this sheet that's rolled up, uh, and just take it and stack it on top of one another. Is that essentially how they how they do the same? They do this in a 
in a, and then they put it in some sort of plastic or metal case of some sort. Yeah, and um, they're actually uh, both batteries come down the same process. So, and then I'll, I'll make a a real quick kind of overall explanation of the process. We have a mixing process. So think of mixing up any other batter, or in this case, it's it looks like paint or any other coating. You know, we are mixing the um, mixing the chemicals, a powder and our solvents, which become our our glue or in our binders, they become our electrochemical materials. We mix those up, uh, we work on the viscosities, and then we coat those down uh, onto the electrode structures, which are thin film substrates. Uh, you know, layman's terms, copper and aluminum foil today. Um, there are some new advancements, which we won't get too deep into, but they get coated on, I mean, it's literally rolls. Think of your, you know, your aluminum foil roll, a Reynolds aluminum foil. We have big versions of that that are several feet wide or meters wide. We actually run those through a machine that then this batter goes into and it's either pooled onto, so like a puddle, but a controlled puddle and or it's sprayed uh, and or it's got other uh, coating thin knife methods. It's the old high definition tape days. Um, Sony, when they quit making high definition tapes, they took thin plastic and they put magnetic films. They took magnetic liquid and coated it real thin on those. When no one was buying tapes anymore, we all went digital, of course. Um, they said, what do we do with all this equipment? And Sony actually came up with thin film coating. So those thin film deposits. So we actually coat them down on these long rolls of film. And then from there, they go into any of the battery structures. So in a cylinder, we cut really long strips out of them when we roll them up. Mm -hmm. That's the cylindrical format. In a pouch cell format, we cut literally like cheese slices out of it. And this is where there is no standard. You know, there's every dimension on the planet. And what they do is they stack those up in layers. So you will stack those up for your voltage and your capacity. It looks like a Dagwood sandwich. Hopefully everybody knows that analogy or a you know, big deli or club sandwich. It's all kinds of electrode layers stacked up uh, with separators in between every one. And then we fill it with electrolyte. It goes into, I always, people hate this analogy who produce the pouches that it goes into. But think of the Capri Sun pouch. Mm -hmm. It's literally an aluminized, uh, it's aluminized material and then it's got a poly coating on it. We put the electrodes inside of there and the liquid that's in your Capri Sun pouch becomes the electrolyte. Mm. Uh, and then we put tabs coming out of it. That's how I attach to the positive and negative. The third format, which we didn't cover, but that's your cell phone, is actually called a prismatic. And so it's actually, it's a blend of the two. Instead of flat stack sheets, you know, kind of sheets of paper all together or a, a continuous roll, this is a flat roll. So what's in your cell phone is where we, you know, think of that rolling mechanism in a cylinder. Now I fold it over like a towel. So I, I take those long strips and I fold it over and over again. That's what's inside of your cell phone. Most, almost all of them, when you look inside, they put it in a, a hard plastic over case or a, mm -hmm. a metal case. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's basically a flattened out cylinder, mm -hmm. if you will. So let's talk a little bit about charging, discharging, you know, and some of the, some of the, you know, to, to, to maximize performance. So uh, let's go back to, you know, lead acid. You'd mentioned that those are best if maintained at f nearly full charge. Yeah. So obviously your alternator's job is to keep it full, 100% charge while driving. And then hopefully between the, the next, you know, from when it's sitting there at, and in your driveway to the next start, it hasn't discharged more than say 20%. So it'll start, yeah. right? And then um, uh, w what are, you know, again, a double A Duracell, what, what, is that a lead acid battery? What, what is that? No, it's uh, most of them are, you know, zinc batteries. There's a lot of different blends that they use of them. So what is a nickel metal hydride battery? What are those? Uh, it, it is, yeah, it's, it's a nickel, it's a full nickel metal instead of a lithium metal that's inside of it. So, so a nickel metal hydride battery, remember those had memory, right? So Correct. remember being taught you want to discharge fully, Correct. recharge fully, because if you, if you get into, you know, staying at, you know, 50%, it'll, it'll remember that and you won't be able to do that. So Very similar to NICAD. NICAD would do almost the same thing as well, the nickel cadmium batteries. So what are those batter what are those type of batteries still used for? What are those commonly found in? So nickel cadmium, I mean, you'll find some of the historical industries that, um, you know, haven't allowed lithium ion to replace. You'll still see NICAD um, in, you know, some vintage, ironically in phones, uh, still portable phones. There's some medical devices that still use them today. A lot of them have converted. Uh, nickel metal hydride are still some of, I think most of them have gone away, but some of the cheaper tool lines because it was a cheaper chemistry at the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody actually, I don't know if you can buy a nickel metal hydride tool anymore because it was the evolution, but I think they've all since gone away. Even the cheapest lines mm -hmm. are all, 
you know, they may be using a lower grade lithium ion, but they're still using a lithium ion cell. Um, I've seen, um, so in the, mil uh, the military world and on the medical world, nickel metal hydride is still used. Uh, and again, that's historical just because they have a lot of testing and certifications and requirements. So lithium ion is still new enough for them that, uh, you know, they, they haven't fully vetted them out enough to be able to replace them, but you're seeing that evolution is, is pretty quick. Um, the, um, yeah, if you think about it, all those chemistries actually wanted to be charged. Um, they want to be on the top end of charge. A, a lead acid wants to be trickle charged. Frankly, the best thing you can do is leave it on maintenance and keep it topped off uh, because of the, it's a high resistance too. That's the other advantage that lithium ion brings to the table. Those other chemistries, um, their, their uh, internal resistance, their IR, their impedance as they're being used became lower and lower and lower. So that's why we can use more voltage. That's why as we draw more power, more wattage out of them, the voltage stays more stout. The voltage lines, the curve, it's not a, it's still a curve, but it's more flat um, or flatter. Um, that's why those chemistries came about is because now I'm not wasting my energy as I pull energy in it out of it or, or, you know, discharge it or I charge it. It's not being wasted in heat. So we've evolved. Those chemistries have been lower and lower resistance. So lithium ion, you know, the lithium ions today are, you know, the frankly about the lowest internal resistance battery. That means more of my energy in there gets converted into usable energy versus gets, you know, converted into heat through that electrochemical mechanism. And so that impedance would be why you can't, why they don't just make a, you know, a double A lithium ion. Because you can't just put a, a, a lithium ion battery in an alarm clock that accepts a double A battery. That's correct, yeah. Because you'd have to have the proper circuit, if you will, the proper resistor. To handle you know, all the voltage and stuff. Right, yeah. right. Capacitor, resistor, you know, whatever the circuit the circuitry looks like to get to, you know, get power to the to the thing, to the circuit board. You can't just put a lithium ion battery and that's because these different battery technologies have different impedances, right? Yeah, they have different impedance. And frankly, even though, you know, they may say 12 volts, um, if you look, a lot of the electronics to design today are designed for a car battery that's charged at 14.4. Your alternator puts out, you know, it de well, it depends on what chemistry exactly on the lead acid, but usually 13.7 to 14.4, 14.2. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to overcome that internal resistance in order to get your battery charged up to the, you know, the 12 voltage mm. plus, plus range to overcome that. Um, but when you think about a, lith uh, a lead acid battery, most of the time it's being used, it frankly under load is you know, in the 10 to 11 volts, it sags quite a bit. And when you, when you crank your starter, it sags pretty heavily. In fact, that's usually the sign of a bad battery is if it, you know, if it drops under eight, when you're cranking it, that means it's starting to age out. If you do that, so the, you know, kind of the usable range of a lead acid is more in that um, eight to 12 volts from a, you know, a state of charge perspective. If you get too high or too low, it's usually hard on it or it's damaging to it where a lithium ion has a broader range. So what that means is though, a lot of your electronics, you know, you think about on a car, um, there's there's uh, several electronics inside the car that won't function below five volts. So if I stack enough lithium ion cells together to make a robust 12 volt cell, frankly, it will run higher than 12. It'll run almost 20 volts. Its range becomes like 2.5 volts, you know, almost, a, or well, not that low, but it goes way under a lead acid and it goes way over a lead acid. So that's the only other disadvantage on the lithium ion side is by replacing it putting it into a lithium ion battery, sorry, putting it into a lead acid application, it, you're actually not using it all. Um, I mean, that's the other reason why they use iron phosphate is because until the systems start to be compatible with the voltage range that a lithium ion can supply, which is very, very broad, we've had to use it in a narrowed scope under the lead acid. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then lithium ion charging, discharging, what is the recommended um, range for those to, to get maximum, um, you know, because we talked about this many of the videos, heat is the enemy. Heat is what wears out or beats up the battery, right? And is a safety risk at some times, yeah. And then, and then, but, but what is, the, what is the, the recommended range in order to get maximum durability out of, a, out of a lithium ion battery and get maximum useful charge or useful um, discharge, I guess, in the future? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it really is application uh, dependent. Um, and, you know, what do you plan to do? How are you trying to maximize the life? I mean, we would always say, you know, the ideal scenario is, you know, is slow is, you know, a, a, what we call a half C or a one C rate. 
and for folks that are like, what, what the heck is that? Uh, that's capacity. So half of capacity rate or, or a one or equivalent to capacity rate. So if we had a three amp hour battery, we would say an ideal, generally an ideal charge range, maybe like one and a half amps would be its maximum charge up to three amps. So that would be again, a half, a 0.5 C as in capacity, not to be confused with current or some other, you know, uh, other thing. So 0.5 C or one C is pretty, you know, on about any lithium ion battery is an ideal. But if you look, most of the fast chargers today are going, you know, one C to two C to three C, um, you know, supercharges and others, you're talking five C and 10 C capacity rates. So if you think about a, 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 you know, 100 amp hour battery pack, now I'm putting at three C, I'm putting 300 amps maximum current into that. Um, the battery will take that and that's the advantage of a lithium ion today is there's such a broad range of charging that I can do to it. But in general, the harder I charge it, the more susceptible it is to heat. That's number one. Uh, number two is there's also starts to be some diminishing returns. At some point I'm putting it in so fast. We used the analogy the other day of kind of a jar. And you know, if I need to fill that jar and take all the air up inside of there, if I'm using sand, you know, sand would be like a low discharge rate. I can fill that jar really easily with sand and probably get almost all the air out of it. You know, it's going to be microscopic in between it. But if I go to a, you know, a, you know, maybe a 2C or a faster charge rate, you know, a, a rapider charge, not a supercharge rate. Now I'm using rocks first and then hopefully towards the end, I can put some sand in, you know, that's where that balancing comes about. Um, you know, the supercharge and, and again, analogy, the battery guys who are you know, engineers who listen to may say it's not exactly that, but it's again, layman's terms is now I'm kind of putting rocks in that jar or, you know, boulders inside that jar. I'm getting it full quick per se, but I'm missing all the extra. So there's a, at some point you're actually diminishing returns for fast charge. And like I said, the, the biggest worry there is heat is then I'm sub, sub, subsec, subsecting it to um, additional heat that is hard on a battery. You know, it just doesn't like the heat cycling. So but again, usage case, you know, you think about the Tesla users. If I'm a if I'm a fleet operator or a taxi cab, you know, they don't necessarily worry about getting 300,000 mile, miles out of their vehicles. They need it. It needs to run. I mean, they run 24-7. So um, there are people who use the fleets. They need that supercharger. They understand it lessens the life. I mean, I don't know any taxi cab, you know, where they're getting 500,000 miles, a great mileage out of the car. That, they, they beat the heck out of them. Um, but, uh, you know, a, a general user wants that kind of mileage. So... So should I cycle the lithium ion? Should I, should I discharge it all the way down and then charge it all the way back up? What's, what's your recommendation there? Um, ideal, ideal range on any lithium battery. Uh, and again, probably, uh, maybe some comments on this, but, and there's some, you know, there's some fluctuation on this range, but typically it's 20 to 80%, you know, keeping it in that 20 to 80% range, not over, I wouldn't say over discharging, but keeping it out of the lower discharge range, uh, which again, you're lessening the performance down there anyways, and keeping it out of the upper range, which frankly ages it quicker. Um, and this, you know, this gets back to the storage. Um, we, we've all been taught, I mean, all these other chemistries have taught us that, as I said earlier, you need to keep them charged up. You want to leave them plugged in. You want to trickle charge them. Lithium ion, um, that's at least today, the stuff you're going to see still does not, that's not ideal. If you're going to store that battery, you're better off to leave it 50% or less state of charge. So use it for some amount of time. And instead of putting it right on the charger for the next time you need it, leave it on the shelf or leave it in the tool. And uh, the next day, come back and use up what's left and have another battery ready to go into it. Um, and again, for some users, um, they're going to say, well, you know, I want a maximum performance all the time. Great. Um, but you're going to see, you know, in some cases, especially the chemistry that's in there, the NCA chemistry, um, it is a high performance, high energy density, uh, but it is also a much lower cycle life. That power tool that, you know, in that case, uh, I believe almost all the ones in Milwaukee are Samsung. You know, they've got a high end Samsung 18650 or 21700. Um, that chemistry is already cycle life short, as in it's one of those that doesn't, doesn't take a lot of cycle life. Um, same thing with your cell phone. It's made for performance. Therefore, it has, you know, we haven't tweaked one that, if you look at like life versus speed versus power versus energy, no one, you know, that's a web chart. No one has a battery that hits all four quadrants. They have, you know, you got to pick where the dots are going to land with the NCA. The best way to optimize that chemistry 
is to charge it when you need it, um, but leave it in some good range of state of charge otherwise to maximize that life that is available. Hmm. So uh, my making fun of people, calling them babies for having a cell phone that's like 40% (laughs) is not necessarily a bad thing. I'm actually in the wrong, and then I keep mine between 80 and 100% at all times. Uh, because I say I'm not a baby, uh, <laughs> you're telling me that I'm not getting the uh, maximum life out of uh, out of my lithium ion cell in my in my in my laptop or my. See, I'm at 82 <laughs> percent on my laptop here. The Apple umbilical cords, yeah. Um, Mine is at you know I'm at like 90 percent on my cell phone. But you're probably still justified in saying that because I'll be honest. Um, I find I, you know we do a lot of training. We have you know we we've had thousands of people now come through our. Um, you know, our courses uh, down at Bic that we teach and then we go remotely and teach these all over the world, uh, to, you know, to engineers and scientists and lawyers and investors and car guys and, you know, you know, all walks of life. Um, I'll be honest, most of the people that you see on that umbilical cord is because they've already trashed their battery and they're trying to um, they're trying to use it as long as they can. I I think you're probably justified in saying that, you know, they're kind of babies because they didn't baby it when they should have and now they've kind of ruined it and they're yeah. stuck to that cord because it no longer has capacity it, it, you know that <laughs> capability is gone versus if you know if we can uh if that, it's one of the things that we can be uh if we can spread the battery faith uh, by the way the the tool suppliers and the apples of the world and the googles and and others are going to be you know they're not going to be happy about it because as a user if your battery lasts longer it's one of the reasons why people replace power tools why they replace phones why they replace laptops and tablets is because the battery is worn out not because the performance is not there anymore right but because the battery is so aged it can't keep up with the performance and they've done that to it by that constantly keeping it charged all the time all right i'm gonna i'm gonna renege on my um my my admitting that i was wrong here i'm not <laughs> wrong no because what i do i keep it fully charged at all times leave it charged on sitting on a charger overnight which is a no-no uh, but I do that because I'm just going to get a new one. And so this would be like I'm getting a GT4. You think I'm going to freaking follow the break-in procedure on the darn manual? Heck no. 2,000 miles? I have 2,600 miles on my GT3 RS. I, I would have just gone to Redline like last month yeah. and had it for a year and a half before you ever drive the darn thing. I'm not doing that. That's stupid. Use it. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the biggest thing I think as long as users understand that we've had folks who complain about battery tech. So again, if you're one of those that, Hey, I want to maximize the performance. Don't be and, cheap. And Get a better freaking job and buy a new <laughs> iPhone every time it comes out. <laughs> Apple will love you for that. That's right. That's yeah, yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. You there know? you go. No, um, again, it maximizes performance that way, but you, again, it's the trade off of cycle life. So, and that's the thing that we fight is a lot of battery guys got, you know, folk, battery users, sorry, that are talking about, I want battery overall battery capability. I mean, some of that is you got to be an MVP at cases. If you want that overall, you know, minimum, you know, that maximum viable across all arenas, you really need to be 20 to 80. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I'm a, I do that on my cell phone and I do that on some of my items, but frankly, some of my others are like, Hey, I know that that's a device that I need to use up and I need it for its maximum capability and performance all the time. And I don't Mm -hmm. care about the life as much. Yeah. I mean, there's no reason you can't. So, yeah, well, it 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 goes. It makes sense that the advantage of my compulsive charging is that I always have, you know, so I never, I've never walked up to a Milwaukee Tool and not had a battery. <laughs> it's never happened in the history of my life, and never will. <laughs> I'm never going to get in my car and be out of gas. It's just yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. The disadvantage, though, is I'm actually hurting the lifespan of my tools and batteries by keeping them topped off all the time. But I say, screw it. I'm doing it the way I want to do it. And Milwaukee loves you. You've bought a, almost almost every tool I think we figured yeah. out now, or virtually ever. You just buy some more batteries. So. What is a LiPo, L-I-P-O battery? I don't even know what that is. That, li- that is a short, um, the acronym for lithium polymer. Okay. Um, that's, the, that's the term that kind of came about from the RC world, uh, uh-huh. so the remote control. But it's a lithium polymer. That is a lithium ion battery. They are the same thing. That's a rechargeable battery. So it's not a lithium metal. It's not a primary non-rechargeable like an alkaline you use it once and throw it away uh-huh. a lipo or a lithium ion are uh, are a hybrid rechargeable structure got it let's see what else are we missing here what else do people want to know i wish battery chargers had a setting for long-term storage that doesn't charge them 100 percent 
Yeah. Actually, that's a that's a great uh, input. In fact, um, you know, even Apple, um, I, I think that it's back out now. Um, sorry, I'm going to knock Apple. I don't know if it was Apple per se, maybe some of the folks at the App Store. Um, but originally, there was a couple of folks that developed an app that if you plugged it in and it sensed it was on too long, and if it was not, they used the motion sensor in the phone. And actually, I think a couple uh, app developers for Google did the same thing, that if basically it was laying on your nightstand plugged in, it would actually only go to 80% unless you overrid it. Like you could, if you set it down, had your thumb on it when you plugged it in, it would go to 100%. Otherwise, it would only charge to 80 to maximize the life and the capability of it. Mm. Um, some of the power tool folks um, are looking at that. I, I can't comment on, you know, Milwaukee or any of those, but I, I there are some other, uh, there's some, we'll just say there are some companies that have considered for these users that have got, you know, their tools in their van or on their shelf, um, if they're going to be doing storage that they have the ability to kind of walk up to the charger put in the battery and say i want full charge or i want storage charge so there is a recognition that that's coming about so so you know someone just made a comment said he think that the he thinks that there's an iphone software update just started implementing trickle charging for overnight chargers um tell me about how the heck does a wireless charger work how does it work when i take my phone and stick it <laughs> on this thing how does that work um, so it's just using the, uh, you know, you're using the magnetic field. It is a, you know, there's, there's more and more capability that's coming through it, but they use a, the magnetic field, um, off of that device. Um, there's a, you know, there's, uh, electricity that's generated there. It's a much lower current. I mean, if you look, you know, your fast chargers that are in your wall, most of them, I mean, the weakest ones today are, you know, are half an amp, you know, at five volts or, you know, they're one amp. Actually, most of them, I think run at three, three and a half, four. I've seen some five amp, you know, wall chargers. Um, when you look at the wireless chargers, they're like, you know, hundreds of milliamps, you know, they're not, they're not a high, um, high power wireless. The advantage is you don't have to plug them in. So you're not wearing out, you know, connectors, you're not having to have a cord, you know, for users, you can just lay it down on a desk or, you know, on the dash of your car. Now they're in cars. It's nice to not have, um, you know, the cords there. So mm -hmm. it is a much slower rate, frankly, um, the, the only other we're seeing with some of the wireless charge, um, as the technology has evolved, it's gotten better. But actually, there is a point on some of these larger batteries that are coming in the newest phones and the newest tools that if you're too slow a charge, it may not be enough to get it all the way topped off. So, you know, some would say, well, if slow charge is good. Well, give me the slowest charge. I'll let my phone charge for, you know, five days before I use it. There's a there's also a diminishing return mm. on the bottom end is that, you know, with that sand, um, what I start to get to is that sand's going in sl so slow um, that I'm, um, that I'm not actually able to fill it all the way up. Hmm. So um, so there's a there's kind of a diminishing return on the slow end as well. That is right. I did notice the I mean, my iPhone giving me a notification saying that, you know, it's going to be charged in six hours or eight hours or something like that. And it's it's recognizing my patterns of, you know, plug-in, I guess, which yeah. is pretty sweet. And, and Tesla's, that, Tesla's done the same thing. There's actually applications for their car now um, for users that, you know, maybe you're going to the airport. And they're going to plug it into a a charger instead of a supercharger they pull up to a regular tesla charger a, a level two and they can program it to say hey i'm going to be gone for you know 30 days out of the country it'll charge it up to an 80 percent and then they can use a timer or the app um that it, it knows when they're going to be back or they can set a schedule and it will finish that charge when they get there so it leaves it in a nice storage range as well well does it also move itself to another parking space <laughs> that'd be kind of cool i i think it probably could i don't know if yeah. they've implemented it yet but yeah, yeah that would be pretty sick yeah so if I, you know, let's say I get a P100, if I get a, you know, if I, if I buy a Model S and um, um, it's your home, um, do you know, do, do, do their superchargers have regular charging function functionality? Or is it supercharge only? Like, you know, we had that Milwaukee. There's a supercharger and there's a regular charger. Yeah, the um, so most of the superchargers, and again, it depends on whether it's, you know, a Tesla brand or there's other companies that are deploying more universal um, they have, you know, smarts, smarts inside of them. So you can set the level. Um, so I drive, uh, I have both electric and, you know, hybrid vehicles. Um, both, all of them are plug in. I've got other ICE engines as well, but our ICE, um, vehicles, but on mine, I can actually select, um, whether I want, uh, what they call level one, which is, uh, basically a 110 volt wall level, mm -hmm. which takes a lot longer, mm -hmm. you know, on the hybrid car, it may only take, you know, six or seven hours. But then there's the level two, which operates in that, you know, 240 volt range. And it is a, you know, it's anywhere, 
let's see what 16 amps to uh, I was trying to remember where the threshold is again I should have this all memorized at this point and then you have kind of your level three and then you have your supercharger so mm -hmm. if you think about in the Milwaukee tool world there's the standard chargers there's the rapid charger which are your level two and then there's the supercharger, which is the same as the Tesla level three. Now, I think in Milwaukee's case, I'm pretty sure that that rapid charger is only rapid charge. Now it, it does look at where the battery's at and a, there's a, there's a charging curve that the maximum current may, may not come out of it. If the battery's really charged up, it'll start at a lower, but I, but I believe at least in theirs, I don't know if they put the full smarts in where. I, I don't recognize, I don't remember that there's actually a selectable mode. I think the, it's kind of pre-programmed to try to pick the best mode and it almost always defaults to the fastest charge until I get to a point where you're on the vehicle side. What you're seeing is most of those manufacturers allow you like my, you know, the Tesla, I get inside, I can actually tell my Tesla if it's connected to a supercharger, I can say charge my car like I'm on a 110 volt plug. I mean, and then, you know, in the 100, that's like, 27 hours or something like that mm. like you know take a day and a half to charge my car mm. um that's okay so um what about you know when the green light goes on on my milwaukee battery because nine times out of ten i stick it on there come back two days later and i forgot it's on there is that bad or is it is it shut it off um you know i think um i don't want to comment for them i think milwaukee would always say hey you know at the end of charge take it off because you know there's always a risk if you would have a you know, electrical fault or an arc or something that, you know, the safety devices, that battery is safe to leave on there. And again, probably going to, hopefully they don't, uh, they're going to recommend you different again, considering that if there's a failure of a system or failure of something they can't control, but in general, um, that battery, it, and by the way, it doesn't trickle. Um, you know, we don't, you know, the old battery chargers used to trickle and there was a difference. You had maintenance charge, you have trickle charge. So you think about on your car, you know, a lot of guys will buy the, um, you know, there's all kinds of the little C-Tech uh, yeah, and, yeah, and, and uh, NOCO and, and, yeah. and, and others. There's a difference between a maintainer and a trickle charger. A trickle charger never stops. Um, a maintainer actually stops on a lead acid battery. Uh, and if they have a, a, lead, a lithium ion, most of them are lithium ion compatible if they are because it charges the batteries up to a voltage uh, it does a constant current constant voltage all the way up to a constant voltage hold and once it reach, reaches a constant voltage it turns off mm. a trickle charge would continue to apply you know 12.4 or 13.2 or 14.4 constantly trickling that battery which is actually bad on the lead acid mm. so you can actually what they call boil you boil the battery slowly by doing that um, lithium ion you don't want to do that you take it up the manufacturer set a what they call a cutoff current. So I I do constant current into the battery as a charge. So I'm putting current in until I get to a voltage. And when I get to that voltage, which at the cell levels, you know, 4.2, when I get to 4.2, I go to a CV, what they call constant voltage hold. I hold it at 4.2 for so long until the it's full. So that's kind of like I've got my, I've got my, you know, if I was using my rocks, I'm rocks, rocks, rocks. And at the top, I go to sand. Mm. I'm like just using the sand to get mm. that perfectly level. And then I stop. I don't pour any more on. The lithium ion says, stop me when I get to a certain current. So when I reach a CV hold at a certain milliamp current stop. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of how those different chargers work. Hmm. I think I'm checked out of batteries. Sorry, too much, uh, too much egghead tech on a Thursday. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of gas here. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting old. We need to go drive or something. Yeah, get some fresh air. <laughs> see my head hit the desk here. <laughs> no, I, I really appreciate you coming all the way down here and giving us some, you know, giving us some, some, some data, some information, some, some, you know. I feel like I've, um, I'm more, especially on this. You know, I tend to be very heavy on what I'm interested in at the moment. And I think you're very similar to me, right? So uh, I'm asking questions around what's going on in my life. It's a very selfish male trait, right? <laughs> my uh, wife would tell you I'm sick, but in a good way. So, yeah. 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 It's like it's like we want to, you know, I want to know what I want to know right now, and I don't want to know anything else. So I don't give a crap about your you know, your dog or your, you know, lake house or anything. I want to <laughs> know about batteries because that's what I'm interested in right at this moment. Yeah. So um, I appreciate you, you know, kind of schooling us up a bit here. What what will probably happen is I'll probably get up to Indiana at some point. Yeah, you we'll need to come check us stuff. out, meet the team. Yeah. yeah, blow up some stuff. You blow up some batteries and show yeah. people some some of the testing you know, equipment and stuff like that. Yeah, we have the uh, the boom rooms there, which uh, you know we always like to say now instead of 
explosions. We like to call it rapid disassembly. Mm. So, uh, you know, watch the, um, and you know, we're always cautious though, to not scare battery users. Cause you hear about the, you know, the, you know, the issues that happen with the hoverboard and, you know, with the, uh, the Dell laptops and, uh, you know, the Boeing Dreamliner, uh, ironically, um, for, you know, folks who aren't battery people, they always attribute it to the battery, but in the end it was actually, it was the system itself. So the, the control system, uh, in nearly every case was the responsibility. The battery in the cell did not fail. And in fact was functioning the way it was supposed to the, the thing that was supposed to manage it. Um, there was some miscues, uh, some misengineering, if you will. Mm. Um, you know, I can, I guess I can call out the engineering community as an engineer myself, like you, um, you know, there were some miscues on the engineering. We didn't, they didn't understand that integration well enough. And actually in almost all cases, it was heat. You know, the theme throughout all these discussions has been heat because of life and performance, but it's also about safety. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that the thermal runaway, which is the, the thing that seems to have happened the worst to all these, that is because of heat. So that heat is induced in a lot of different ways, ways in which we talked about, you know, charging and usage and, and demand and performance that's required of it. So we can mitigate and maintain that thermal um, you're going to maximize everything you can get out of that battery in that hmm. system. Cool. All right, guys. I appreciate your time. Appreciate you a uh, little impromptu um, live stream. The live stream wasn't as important to me as just having the information. I think we only had a, you know, a couple hundred people in here. Um, but the, the more important thing is this will live you know online forever, and we can always reference back to it. Uh, and then, of course, you'll want to check out. I mean, we just shot them you know, yesterday and today. We just shot the videos on... Uh, all the Milwaukee um, um, batteries, and got we got into more general battery discussion as well. Talked more about uh, you know the 1865 and 217, you know 21700. Um, the um, um, the other thing we dug into this morning was uh, talking about putting you know high output batteries on specific tools and what we you know what that might do to the tool to imp in improve performance or improve longevity and which batteries might we suggest. And of course, I'm going to be using a lot of that information that you've shared with me to try to figure out, you know, what's, what's the lineup and what's, you know, I think that my role in this world is to teach people how to buy stuff. Uh, and so I'm going to teach people how to buy it most efficiently and, and, and get what they, you know, get what they need, not get what's on sale, not get what's the best deal, not get what you get, but get the right thing, Yeah. you know, and, and get, you know the best lineup of, of stuff so anyway thanks for listening uh we'll have this you know up on the podcast as well for those of you who want to listen on uh in the car or wherever anyway we'll uh we'll be live tomorrow 2 p.m for our normal you know friday call or friday live stream and then um yeah i'm about to finish the milwaukee project i've got uh, the gt500 coming to detail on monday and tuesday uh, the civic uh should be back in about a week uh, I got to start to put the pressure on my buddies at Sound Emotion, so that'll be back to my Moton suspension comes. Uh, we got some projects for Jeff's and Kyle. Or uh, I don't know if Kyle has anything, but Jeff's and Bryce, Bryce's car, the S550 Mustang, and then the um, you know, Bryce's uh, Miata. Um, or, oh no, sorry, it's a MX5. Yeah, the Miata project. We got the some MX arrow to put on that, so we got some car stuff, some detailing stuff coming. I need a break from this tool stuff. My brain hurts. Got to get back to cars. That's what I said. We need to. Get, I feel like I need to go on a drive. We got a yeah. terrible rental, um, mm. but we're going to get out and at least do something with it today. Yeah. So. No, I need to take a nap. <laughs> anyway, catch you guys soon. Thanks.